morning, everybody. I'm up at Boot Lake Nature Preserve today. And I'm trying to get a view of this huge flock of sandhill crane that is out there on the edge of this small lake. I wish I would have brought my zoom camera with me, but I didn't. And this is as close as I can zoom in. But there are hundreds of them out there. They're going to be in the backdrop as I make this video today. Okay, I am all set up here. And another huge flock of sandhill crane just came in and landed back there behind me. So, I don't know, you may see them in the video. They're, they're up there along the edge of the lake, which is back behind me. And they're kind of hard to see on the video, but there's a lot of them back there. There's hundreds of them. We are in Numbers chapter 11 today. All right Now here, the narrative completely changes in the book of Numbers. Now the first 10 chapters were all about them getting organized, getting ready to move, and the people were all very obedient and very respectful of what God wanted them to do. And that's what we saw in the first 10 chapters. Now, things take a big turn and they get ready to march out and they're on their journey here in this part. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And when the people complained. So it starts out on a negative note right away. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. All right, there's a lot there in that first verse. Uh, first of all, where it says, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them. That word fire there is the Hebrew word ash. And it can mean literally fire, but there's several other meanings for it also. It can also mean uh, a spiritual fire. Kind of like the fire that came out from the Lord that that uh, killed Nadab and Abihu over the strange fire that they offered. You know, that was back in uh, the book of Leviticus where we saw that happen. But it's the same word that's used there. It's the same word that's used when they speak of uh, the fire of the glory of the Lord also and like the pillar of fire and things like that. So I'm not real sure here. This might have a literal meaning. It might have a spiritual meaning. It might be a double meaning. It may be both. But it says there that it displeased the Lord. Now another way of interpreting that phrase right there, that it displeased the Lord, it could be interpreted, it was evil in the ears of the Lord. When he heard them complaining, now, you know, generally in life, complaining usually arises out of people failing to see the big picture, right? Just when you're in a certain situation in your life and you get discouraged about things and you start complaining, usually, you know, later on when you look back on it and you say, well, I just didn't see what was going on there, right? It's failing to see the big picture of what God has intended in all of this. Because we all go through trials and tribulations in our life where at the time it's frustrating. And we can complain sometimes about that. But if we look at the bigger picture of what's going on here and what the Lord has intended for us, where he's taking us and things like that, you know. So that's a big thing here. They, This is only a little over a year since they left Egypt. And they spent almost that whole first year at, at Mount Sinai. So you would think they would be glad to be finally moving on. 
And it doesn't say specifically what they were complaining about either. It doesn't say. It just says that they were complaining and the Lord heard it and it displeased him. And the fire burnt in the uttermost parts of the camp, which is interesting also. So that's what in the in the outer edges of the camp, I guess. Uh, why didn't the fire burn on the inside part? I don't know. And what type of fire was it? We don't really know. We can only assume that it's you know maybe a physical fire. Maybe not. It might be something spiritual also. Verse two, and the people cried unto Moses when this happened. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. It stopped. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now the meaning of that name that he named it, Tabera, is literally burning. Verse 4, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. It's kind of strange way that's interpreted there in the King James, but that's what it says. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? There's quite a few things there also. The mixed multitude, it was like an infection that was among them. There were people that went along with them, Egyptians or what, whatever people they were. The mixed multitude was people that weren't Israelites. They weren't of the family of Jacob, but they were with them. They left Egypt with them. And it says that they, the mixed multitude, that weren't the Israelites, they went a-lusting, is what it says. So... They were desiring some other type of food than what they had. And then it says that the children of Israel started weeping over it. It rubbed off on them. So they started complaining also. And the meat that they had obviously wasn't good enough. They had all kinds of flocks and herds with them, remember? And they ate the peace offerings... You know, so they had these all the time. This happened every day, that there'd be offerings offered and things like that. So they were getting meat, you know, would have been beef or mutton or whatever it was from the things that were being sacrificed. But that wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. We can be like that. You know, if we have the same thing all the time, then we want something different, you know. And that's what it was for them. They were complaining about it. And in saying, when they said, who shall give us flesh to eat, they're kind of insinuating that God is not able. You know? It goes on in verse 5, and they say, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions, and the garlic. Well, you know, they're moving, so they aren't going to have gardens and things like that where they're going to be able to grow these things. And God was feeding them with manna, with heavenly bread. Now, where it says leeks there, notice it says leeks and the onions. Now, leeks are onions. Um, another way that could have been translated there, where it's translated leeks, that is actually... The Hebrew word haser, and usually what that means is either grass or herbage of some sort, herbs, you know. Uh, out of the 21 times that word is in Scripture, it's translated as grass 17 of those 21 times. This is the only time that it's translated as leeks, and I'm not sure why they did that, because a leek is a type of onion. All right, so I think more than likely the leeks were herbs. Verse 6, it goes on, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So here, 
They're being unappreciative of the bread from heaven that was coming down, that God was feeding them miraculously on this. And from what it sounds, it sounds like it was delicious, you know. And it describes it a little bit here in verse 7. It says, and the manna was as coriander seed. I don't know if that's in looks or in taste. Um, coriander seed are these little seeds. They're like little balls, you know, the spice. And the color thereof as the color of bdellium. Now, bdellium is a yellowish type of uh, fragrant gum resin is what bdellium is. The actual Hebrew word there is bedola or bedola. And that can also be translated as hoarfrost, that it was like frost upon the ground, and it was, it was the color of frost. And it can also be translated as like pearl. So in all of this, I kind of get the idea here that the manna was like little balls, like pearls. The coriander seed is little balls. And they ground it up, and it was really good. And it tells a little bit about it here in verse 8. It says, and the people went about and gathered it. It would be on the ground every morning, except for the morning of the Sabbath when they were to rest. They would get a double amount the day before. And it says they would gather it and grind it in mills. All right, so there's these little balls, I guess. And they would crunch up like grain. It says that they would beat it in a mortar or bake it in pans, and they made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Isn't that interesting? Bread of heaven. We still don't know what it is, really what it was. And the name manna actually meant, what is it? Now, in the book of wisdom, Every now and then I'll throw in these apocryphal scriptures like this because it's really a shame in the Protestant church that these scriptures have been kind of hidden from us. Uh, there's other books. The original King James had 80 books. And it had, the King James Version had 80 books. Look it up. It had 80. Clear up until the 1800s sometime. And it was removed. The Protestant church had had them removed. A lot of these books are still in some of the Catholic canon. And so people think that they're Catholic books. They're not Catholic books. They're Jewish books. And they were in the Septuagint. They were in the scriptures that Jesus and the apostles read. So these are, are very important books. And the book of wisdom is actually one of my favorites. And it says there about the manna. In Wisdom chapter 16, verse 20 there, it says, Thou fedest thine own people with angels' food, and didst send them from heaven prepared without their labor, able to content every man's delight and agreeing to every taste. That's a little bit of insight there into manna. Is saying there in the book of wisdom that it tasted what each person would, how they would desire it to taste. <laughs> Isn't that something? Going on here, verse 9. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it overnight. It was there in the morning for them to gather. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. Every man in the door of his tent and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. Now, there are several different types of complaining. Right in the beginning of the book there, it doesn't really say what they were complaining about. And the Lord heard it and that's when the fire was kindled. I don't know whether Moses even knew about that. The text doesn't really tell us. Well, obviously, he, he did later because he wrote it down. He recorded it here. But here, Moses was displeased about it, too, it says, over them complaining about the food. 
They were complaining about the manna. You know, and in retrospect now, and I think about this a lot in these stories here, in retrospect, we look back at it and say, how could they complain about that bread from heaven? You know, how could they? Well, we weren't there. We weren't in their place. And human nature is like that. We get tired of the same old thing, same old thing every day. And we can become unthankful. We can become ungrateful. We should be thankful for everything we have. You know, even if we're in a situation where we have to kind of eat the same thing every day, we still should be thankful for it, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says there, because when they knew God, which they did, they saw him manifest himself many times in physical ways. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now there, in that passage in Romans 1, it's talking about all different types of sins, you know. But that right there, what it says about them being unthankful, even though they knew God, that fits very well into this story, doesn't it? Verse 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Now Moses starts complaining. See how it catches? It really does. And we see that so much in our in the political and the world of the media today. So much. Uh, you know, we complain about government. We complain about all kinds of different things, and it's catching. One person complains, and then pretty soon everybody's complaining. There may be a reason. There may be a just cause for complaining. But remember, in all of this, we should always be thankful for what we have, for what the Lord has given us, and all of the blessings, which are too many to even count. Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? (laughs) Now remember that he didn't want this to begin with. You know, when the Lord came to him in the burning bush, he didn't want it. He didn't want to do this. But the Lord chose him. And he was obedient, and he has done all this. But here it's kind of coming out now. He's He has the responsibility of all these people on him, you know? He goes on in verse 12, Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? He's feeling like that he has to nurture these people, that he has to carry them, and all the responsibility is all on his shoulders. Now, what he says there, there's one phrase there which has been taken today by the trans community. And they use that as an excuse for their perversion. Right here, where it says, nursing father. Now, that was translated that way in the King James, you know, but it's not literally talking about a father breastfeeding. It's not talking about that. The word nursing father is the Hebrew word aman. And what that means is to support, to confirm, to uphold, or to nourish. So all he's saying here is that he feels like he has to carry all these people, like like a bunch of babies, a bunch of uh, helpless babies that he has to nourish and feed and carry. That's what he's talking about here. He, he's not talking about a man breastfeeding, okay? Yeah, and there are some people that have tried to say that. But he's not talking about that. Verse 13. Whence... Should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. 
Now, once again, it's just kind of strange because they had flesh to eat. They had, they had beef. They had mutton. They had these, these things from the sacrifices where they had meat to eat. But it wasn't good enough. They wanted the delicacies of the Egyptians that were there that obviously they were able to eat. Different types of fish and, you know, they had farmland there. So they had all different types of things to eat. Here they're traveling in the wilderness, so they don't have those things. And God is providing for them this bread from heaven. Verse 14, he goes on, Moses, and he's complaining to God. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. He's just saying that it's more than he can take. He just doesn't want to take it anymore. And if it's going to be this way, then just kill me. And he adds there that I might find grace in thy sight. And if I have found grace in thy sight so far. And he had. He had been an obedient servant. You know, and he was only human. But here, it wasn't just the people that were complaining. Now, it's also Moses is complaining about them complaining. Verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, people that were respected, and officers over them. And bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. He wanted Moses to gather 70 wise men, elders, people that were respected in their wisdom and whatnot among the community. He goes on in verse 17, And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh and ye shall eat. Now, <laughs> this reminded me of a psalm. One of the psalms of David, he talks about this here, about what happened there in the wilderness. In Psalm 78, verses 17 through 20, he says, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spoke against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Sure he can. Yeah. In the middle of your wilderness, he can give you what you need. <laughs> At the time when it seems like all is lost, and you don't know what way you're going to turn, there's always a way. There's always a table in the wilderness, so to speak. You know? Verse 19. Now this is what Moses is to tell the people, what the Lord is telling Moses to say to the people. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Yeah, they were complaining that they had even left Egypt. Wow. You know, I can't say that I've ever really gotten to that point where I've regretted following the Lord. You know, I know that there's people that have, 
And I know it's a familiar thing. You know, it happened here. They wanted to go back to Egypt. You know, sometimes people get to the point where they're so discouraged, they say, you know, why did I ever even come out of my former life, you know, and follow this road that the Lord has me on? Because it can be difficult. Sure. We aren't promised a bed of roses in this life, you know. <laughs> we go through all kinds of trials and tribulations, and all these things build us up, though. And we learn a lot from it, you know. The Lord is like a loving parent who guides us through these things, and it's for our own good, you know. Verse 21, And Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? So Moses doesn't know what God's going to do. So he's just questioning, how are you going to do this? How are you going to feed all these people? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Yeah. I think of the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels here. You know, when the Lord Jesus broke the bread and the fishes and it fed all those people. Well, that kind of pictured this, you know, Moses is wondering, how are you going to feed all these people? It was more than four or five thousand. There were millions of them out there. Verse 24, and Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him. And took of the spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Okay, now in prophesied there, our current meaning of that word, you know, when we talk about prophesying or a prophet or a prophecy, we think of like foretelling the future or something. That's not necessarily what that means. And even in the gift of prophecy in the New Testament, it doesn't mean that. More accurately, it is saying things that are given to you by God. When things come out of your mouth that is not something that came from you, it's something that the Lord gave you. It's a miraculous sign of his word coming out of his people in ways that they didn't plan. It's not anything that they thought of. It's from God himself. So that's what they're doing here. They prophesied and did not cease. Now in verse 26 it says here, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written. So they were two of the 70, and for some reason, they weren't there gathered with the others for some reason. They were somewhere in the camp, though. And it says, but they went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So whatever reason it was, I doubt that they were being disobedient in any way. There was some reason that they weren't gathered with the rest of them. But they prophesied too. It's just showing how this, the power of God like that is not dependent upon location. So the others were gathered around the tabernacle and they prophesied, but these other two that were chosen but weren't there for whatever reason that was, they were somewhere else in the camp somewhere, they prophesied also. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them there even though they weren't gathered with the others. That's what it's showing here. The anointing of the Lord finds us, regardless of location. And 
today we could compare that with say say you're watching something on television where people are being blessed in a place that's not where you are and many times we can feel that blessing where we are even though we're not gathered in that assembly that we're watching right because the Spirit of God is not dependent on location we can be blessed a thousand miles away just like the people that are right there in that location are being blessed amen verse 27 and there ran a young man and told Moses and said Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp <laughs> and Joshua the son of Nun the servant of Moses one of his young men answered and said my Lord Moses forbid them the Joshua didn't like that these other two were prophesying like that in the camp and Moses said unto him envious thou for my sake would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them so basically he's saying no I'm not gonna forbid them doing that the Spirit of God came upon them where they are and Moses got him into the camp he and the elders of Israel so they went through the camp and calmed the people you know he had these others to help him bring all the complaining under control I guess verse 31 and there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side surrounding the camp round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth okay a cubit is a foot and a half so if it's two cubits high it was three feet high of quail this wind came from the sea and brought all these quail in all around the camp three feet deep Wow now that was something miraculous verse 32 and the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails he that gathered least gathered ten homers that's a measurement and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp so everybody there got some of these quail okay so obviously this was a delicacy to them in a way it was different than what they were eating and while the flesh was yet between their teeth ere it was chewed the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague all right they made hogs of themselves you know and he allowed them to do this they complained so he gave it to them but their lust and their greediness for it made them sick so it was obviously bad enough here where a lot of people were killed by it, it says that he smote the people with a very great plague then verse 34 says and he called the name of that place Kibroth Hateava I think I'm saying that right Kibroth Hateava because there they buried the people that lusted now the name what he named it Kibroth Hateava actually meant graves of lust Wow their lust and greediness for something other than what God was giving them killed them verse 35 and the people journeyed from Kibroth Hateava unto Hazaroth and abode at Hazaroth now the name of Hazaroth that just simply means settlement so I think it's signifying there that it settled they got to Hazaroth which meant settlement so the issue was passed it was settled 
Now, did the people learn something from this? I would assume that they did, you know, because it made them sick. They had so much of this quail that it made a lot of them sick and it killed some of them. Now, that's the end of the chapter there. In this whole thing, it just makes you think about how we should be thankful, how we should be grateful for what we have. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6-8 through eight say, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Yeah. You know, it is so easy for us in this world to become unthankful or impatient or unsatisfied even when the Lord has blessed us in so many ways in more ways than we can even count you know and a lot of times the way that he blesses us is not what we would consider blessing and it's not really what we're asking for but he knows what's best for us right I've had to experience a lot of this in the last two and a half years after the loss of my wife, you know. <laughs> There's things that he gives us that are hard to swallow, that are, that are hard to take. But then later on, as we get a little bit further down the road, we can look back and we can see the things that we learned from it and the great blessings that came out of a lot of times things that at the time are suffering and our pain and our hurt but these things all build us up into being what the lord would like for us to be right let's pray heavenly father we just come before you today and we just want to thank you for all the blessings in our life Lord, for everything that you do for us, that you feed us and you clothe us and you give us air to breathe and water to drink. And we just praise you for all these things that we have here in this physical realm. And we know that it's just a vague image of what we will have <laughs> when we're perfected and we are with you. Lord, I just thank you for this time together with my friends, and I thank you for your word. Lord, I give you all the glory in all of these things. I ask that your word would draw people in. I ask all these things in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. All righty. That was a big change in the narrative, really. Because, like I said, up until this point, the people were very agreeable. Very agreeable, very obedient. And then as soon as they start moving, then sin enters in. Now, if you saw that it did come from a mixed multitude. So, that's how sin comes in a lot of times. From outsiders. You know? And this is the enemy. I believe this is the enemy. This is Satan and his minions that sow discord. You know, they'll sow discord among the outer parts. Just like the fire hit the outskirts of the camp there, that's usually where it starts. There's complaining and stuff in the outside, and then it seeps its way into the inside. And it can destroy uh, a lot of things. It can destroy things that the Lord built, you know churches, families, a lot of things like that. So we need to keep our guard up and watch for these things so that we can keep them from creeping in and contaminating what we have. Amen. But I love you all and I'll see you next time around. Bye-bye.